Super epic intro. I don't think I've ever had one of those before. And uh, no matter how many times you hear it, it never gets old. And we've heard it a lot, trust me. Um, so welcome to Dev Plus Track. We're a little bit alt dev stuff that's, that's fun and different and not our, our usual fare. So kick back, relax, enjoy it. And yeah, well, let's, let's see where the afternoon goes. So I'm fortunate, um, I'm fortunate to have worked with a lot of you in the room. I'm very lucky in that way. But uh, for those of you that don't know me, hi, I'm Mike. I work for a department called ATC, right? And if you don't understand what ATC stands for or what they really do, don't worry, neither do we. <laughs> um, I've been hacking on the web since GeoCities was a thing. So who here has built GeoCities websites back in the day? Anyone? Anyone? Thank you. I see one, two. Great. Um, I've had the privilege of working with a whole bunch of mainstream programming languages, but I've had a long-lived love affair with JavaScript. I know, judge me, I'm an apologist. Um, I've also almost come to terms with the fact that I'll never grow a programmer beard. Okay, <laughs> so don't judge my competence based off of that, but fine. Um, I'm a co-organizer for the Josie.js meetup group. Please feel free to come through, um, listen to it. We've got a whole bunch of cool people talking about cool topics. Um, and more pertinent to this conversation, I've shipped a whole bunch of single page application frameworks to production. Right, th th no, no, too soon, no. too soon. <coughs> You're eating into my time here. Okay, so where are we gonna start? What are we gonna talk about, right? Let's start with the learning something along the way part first. So we're gonna, I'm pretty sure most people here have worked with some measure of request response paradigm before. The entire internet is built off of it. Um, and it's basically the most common messaging pattern that we can use nowadays. And let's look at how it was started, right? Because in the 60s and 70s, we were writing procedural code, which worked really, really well. And we decided we wanted to farm out some of that so we didn't have it all sitting on one machine, right? So we wanted to call the procedure or function on another machine. And so, hey, RPC was called. So we've got this thing where we pass function parameters or, or request objects to a method and we get something back, except we're doing it over the wire now. Um, this has made its way into imperative programming, and imperative programming in the OO sense, very, very heavily, and we rely on this to this day. There's a whole bunch of paradigms, uh, HTTP, TCP, IP, uh, REST, SOAP, everything is built on top of this idea. And I'm not trying to say it's old-fashioned, but John Travolta is still trying to figure out what the difference is between CORBA and SOAP. Okay, so then, moving straight along. We, um, we in we, a lot later on, late 80s, early 90s, started introducing um, ideas of streaming processing and processing streams alongside digital signal processing. Um, and this led us to, to looking at our data rather than a whole thing as data over time, continuously. And it led us down a whole bunch of functional paradigms where we needed to, to treat it like we would mathematically. Um, and this, this, this we see a lot in file system inputs um, audio inputs, external hardware interfacing, large files that we couldn't load up the whole thing at one point in time, or we couldn't serialize the whole message. Um, these things needed to be chunked apart, essentially. Um, and this led to a, a resurgence in the way that we, we write, um, write, write code in a functional sense, but writing functional code is really, really, really hard. Okay? So then after that, there was a trend to taking a sort of a, a median approach which is to say, we'll program reactively. So we still want to use our, our, our functional ideas and bake in a functional concepts into imperative languages, like C Sharp with lambdas, Java, I think they're called futures, am I right? What are they called? Anyway, uh, and JavaScript has functions as a first class citizen. Um, and this, this is called reactive functional programming to a sense, except reactive functional programming from a purist perspective is still operating on discrete data. When we talk about reactive programming, we're chunking this stuff into discrete data sets and rather looking at the discrete things that are changing over time. So we can look at this rather than a, a new idea, but rather an evolution combining a whole bunch of patterns together. Observer pattern, iterator pattern, functional paradigms, and particularly the swing towards immutable programming. So, to have a more explicit analogy, right? So if we look at request response where the one arrow represents the request that gets sent and the, the other arrow uh, represents the reply coming back. There's only one real data point in motion at any point in time 
And if we were to belabor this with an analogy of a conversation, it's basically the definition of a one-sided conversation, right? One person asks a question and the other person responds. So kind of like a, a project manager asking a developer for estimates. Give as little information as possible. Okay, and then moving on, when we're looking at streaming data, we're looking at a continuous source of data. And I know this isn't entirely accurate, but still, um, the, the principle still holds. So you're both transmitting and receiving data at the exact same point in time. And again, to belabor the same metaphor, if this was a conversation, it would be like a room of teenagers all talking at the same time and still managing to listen to one another. But hey, so when we move on to reactive, okay, what we do, the first thing we do is we flip around that response stream and we rather treat it as just a new source of data. Okay? So essentially, with reactive programming, we, we treat them as separate but conjoined streams where every single operation on a stream creates a new stream of data points. Everyone is distinct, but we have this concept of data points over time. Okay. So we still digest them discreetly, which is something that we can do relatively expediently. Okay, so let's move along to a little bit of technology. I don't have very many more slides because I'm more a code guy. Um, so we're going to look at RxJS. There are a whole bunch of um, Rx frameworks that you can use, Java and C Sharp Prime amongst them. This came out of a Microsoft research project originally. And basically RxJS or Rx sells itself as observe a pattern done right. And we're going to see a little bit of that. Um, but it's a really, really big library. There's a hell of a lot to it. And we're only going to use a very, very small amount of it. So building on top of that, we're going to send some stuff over the wire, right? So we are going to use HTTP, but on top of HTTP, we're going to use WebSockets. So we can have the server sending events to our front end. Now, we can do that natively, but that's pretty cumbersome to demo in a, a live demo. So I'm going to use an abstraction layer on it called Socket.io, because it plays well with Express, which is what I'm going to use for the server, and it plays pretty well with the browser front end. Lastly, we're going to look at Angular, right? This is not an Angular talk. This is not an Angular talk. If you want to listen, hear more about Angular, go listen to Jerry's talk a bit later. Okay, yes, don't, don't look nervous. It's awesome. Um, but I am going to show you some bits and pieces. Now, the reason why Angular is because Angular bakes the concept of RxJS into it. It does all of its data binding using RxJS. So it's a first class citizen, so to speak. We're going to use the Angular CLI from a workflow perspective, so you're going to get some sense of that, and you get some sense that it's pretty powerful to use. Okay, but I'm a, I'm a coding kind of guy, so that's all my slides. So a word of warning, right? This could be awesome, or it could be a hot mess. It's dependent on the Twitter API, which is notoriously uh, uh, unstable and temperamental. It's dependent on the conference Wi-Fi working, oh, please, um, which is notoriously unstable. And it's dependent on you as the audience getting involved, right? So, and you're notoriously unstable. <laughs> okay, but let, let's, move, let's move straight along. Okay, so minimize that. Let's go. I have scaffolded out two simple parts of this application, a client and a server. And all I've done is I've basically created it because you don't want to spend the next 45 minutes downloading NPM packages. Okay? And I've baked in a couple styles just so that it looks right and you don't see me typing CSS, which is going to take the rest of the afternoon. So we're going to start off on a simple express application. Basically, we're just going to be able to initialize um, our express server initialize the server, we're going to declare socket IO, and we're basically going to let this stuff listen on port 3000, which you can see on line 5 there. Thereafter, oopsie, always typing on a new keyboard, hey? Tony wouldn't let me use my own laptop, he wanted to give me a real uh, handicap. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to use a set interval method, um, and all set interval is going to do is every 3000 milliseconds, or every three seconds, it's going to call something that's going to basically emit a ping back down the wire to whatever this thing is connected to. All right, so starting up, we're just going to go into our server. Oh, I'm already in the server. NPM start. And there our server is started. Okay, awesome. Now, if we take a look at our Angular application, and I'm not going to decompose what it's made of, um, but we'll see some bits and pieces. Um, we can, just using the Angular CLI inside the right directory, can everyone see that fine? Is that fine? Awesome. Okay. If we ng serve here, and ng is just the, the CLI uh, instruction, it uses something called Webpack to build all of the modules, where it does a whole bunch of the, the bundling and transpilation for you. So it's really, really easy. It's basically me being incredibly lazy. 
because um, anybody that's done that themselves knows that it's really, really tricky to do. Okay, so there, there it's working. We're just basically going to leave that running. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a component that's going to sit inside this Angular application that's going to represent our ping. So I'm going to use the CLI to just go ng generate component to component, and we're going to call it ping creatively. Oopsie, I'm in the wrong directory. That was bound to happen. Okay. So we're going to generate that, and it's going to create a couple of things. It's going to create an HTML file, a TypeScript file, um, and it's going to update the, the app module. I'm not going to take a look at that now. We're going to look a little bit later. But if we go take a look at our TypeScript file to start off with, so ping.component.ts, okay, in here we've got something that looks relatively, wait, let's full screen that. Great. We've got something that looks relatively familiar. Um, it's sort of JavaScript with a couple extra types, and it's got a, annotations, which is really the big thing that, that TypeScript adds over it. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to call outside of TypeScript. Um, again, because I'm lazy, I'm going to reference socket or declare let. I'm going to reference an external library called socket IO, which is the client of it. And then inside here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to create a local property called should, should ping equals false. And we're just going to, whenever we get a ping from the wire, update should ping. Okay. Now in our constructor, we're going to connect to a socket. First format our code, just make sure it's pretty. We're going to connect to a socket. We're going to respond to an on ping. When we get that ping as a callback, we're going to uh, set the value to true again, so flip flop it. And then we're going to call a set timer that after a second is going to set it back to false. It's a little bit clunky code, but this is typically how you then end up writing request response callback streams. On our front end, so ping our component HTML. Let's throw this away. Let's ping. We're just going to use an Angular property binding, which says we're going to set the CSS class. We're going to set the CSS class to a class called should ping. And the condition inside these square brackets is the ping property that's on our TypeScript. Uh, sorry, uh, it's going to set it to the ping class off of the should ping property that's on our TypeScript. OK, that we're going to update manually. Now, the last thing I have to do is I need to add this to the actual app component. So, oopsie, oopsie. Control's not where I expect it. Um, and inside here, we're just going to go app ping. Oh, come now. There we go. No. You know, you practice it, and it works when you practice it, but it doesn't work when you're up here. OK, hopefully that works now. And if we go back to the front end, after a tense three-second wait, yay, we've got a pinging thingy that's coming back from our server. Now, this is basically if the Twitter API tells me to go uh, forget myself, and we've at least seen something. Okay. So, not even an ironic applause. You guys are a tough crowd, hey? <laughs> Damn it. I'm assuming that means that you're paying attention, so I'm just going to roll with it. Okay, so, so this is all awesome, but that's not what we came to see. We want to write better code than this. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce some parts of reactive extensions. Okay. So, for those, we're going to import a behavior subject and debounce as an operator. Okay, now if behavior subject, let me just show you what that is and then I'll explain it. Ping, oopsie, oopsie. Okay, so behavior subject, we're going to change the type from being a primitive type of Boolean to being a subject that takes a type of Boolean underneath it. Now that's basically a, a specialized type of, obs of observable that lets us directly control the value as well as subscribe to the event. So it lets us directly manipulate the thing to create a reactive stream. A little bit faked, but fine. And then inside here, we can change our callback hell code, which would scale really poorly, into something that looks a little bit more like this. So on our socket ping, what we do is we call the next method of our observable, sending through the true value. And then completely separately, we say, well, we're also going to observe or subscribe implicitly to that stream with a debounce operator that's going to debounce any changes, and after a thousand milliseconds, we're going to set it back to false. Okay, now we need to make one more additional change for this. Angular understands the fact that this is now not a primitive type, but it's something that it needs to implicitly subscribe to. Well, it, it doesn't understand that, so we have to queue it in by saying that this thing is going to be async. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully, yes, we get a ping. Yay, it still works. 
Cool. All right. So that's the first part. Then, um, thereafter, we're basically going to say that this is, we're creating an explicit socket connection and we can't do this in every component and application. So we're going to abstract the stuff behind a service, right? So I'm going to go back to our CLI and I'm going to ng generate, but I'm going to use the shortcuts now. So I'm going to ng g for generate, s for service, I'm going to call it, call it stream service. Now that's going to do two things. It's going to create our stream service application or service file, and then it's going to complain about us saying that it doesn't know how to provide this thing. Now Angular has dependency injection baked in by default, right? So if we go to our module, which I didn't show you earlier, but I'm going to show you now, we'll see that it, it declares how the stuff inside it needs to be initialized, basically, at runtime. So it doesn't understand the life cycle of our, um, our stream service, which sits over here, which is just marked as an injectable. A component, it can figure out how to do it because there's only one way, but the stream service, um, there's, there are options. So in our module, which I've now lost, module. Okay, so in our module, basically all I'm going to do is I'm going to import the stream service. Import stream service. I, I have a malfunction. I can't talk and type at the same time. So please forgive me. So stream.service, and we can see some auto-completion there, which is one of the nice things that Visual Studio Code gives us um, because it's using TypeScript. And then all we do is in our providers, we just say, well, we just want you to give us a new instance whenever you provide that, whenever you asked for that thing. Okay. Now, I'm going to take our stream service, and I'm going to throw all of this away, and I'm basically just going to, oopsie, I'm just going to uh, seed it with what we had in the other file, which is basically just to say, create the socket in here, and then just have our simple debounce code. Now, in our ping component itself, we can throw this stuff away. And finally, all we're going to do is we're going to, as a part of our constructor, we're going to pass in or tell it we want a stream service. I mean, who's worked with similar constructor injection techniques in other languages? Right? C Sharp, Java? Oh, come now. <laughs> I have no faith that you're going to tweet at all. Anyway, so, so uh, that goes in there. And in our component, basically all we need to do is we've got our stream as a public property or a public uh, um, uh, injector class. And all we need to do is bind onto stream.ping. Okay. Now, if everything goes well, yay, the ping is not broken. But clearly, clearly, you didn't come here to see a ping, right? You came here to see a Twitter wall, so I need to up my game. All right, so let's go back to our server. Well, actually, before I go back to our server, I'm going to save my future mic some heartache, and I'm going to stop the server. Okay, then if we go to our index.js, we're basically going to do a couple of things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to configure our Twitter stream with a whole bunch of private access keys so that we can connect to it securely, okay? After our Twitter stream, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, sorry, we're actually going to stream this stuff, which says that we're going to call a streaming method called statuses.filter, or statuses forward slash filter, and this is very similar to what we saw with the web sockets, and we're going to track a whole bunch of things, right? BBD software, my name, because I'm egocentric, Dev plus and BBD escape. And we can add anything. Anyone, any other suggestions? Excuse me, keep it clean, huh? <laughs> I know your type. Okay. All right. So then after that, all we're going to do is we're going to then emit on every single tweet that comes in from that stream, we're going to emit it down the wire with, with socket.js. But now Angular is going to reload itself the whole time. So I just want to basically keep track of a list of tweets in an array and we're just going to oopsie format we're just going to unshift um, onto that array which is every tweet that comes in is just going to be smashed onto the front of it okay and so that in nothing crashes we're just going to truncate it at 100 tweets now after that we're going to add a simple um, get all method that is going to when we call for tweets it's just going to send us the entire list so far so then when it refreshes we're going to get the entire lot of them we also are going to set it up using cores because I was super lazy and I had them on different ports because it was expedient. All right, so now we get to npm start that and hopefully, hopefully, people are going to start playing with and at least do something, right? Otherwise, this is going to be super boring. Okay, great. So now let's move back to the front end, the Angular application. So we've got 
Let's just minimize that. Let's go to our service. Okay. So in our service, we're going to need a couple additional things. Okay. We're going to use a couple more RxJS operators. And you can see there's this weird syntax. Because RxJS is really, really massive, you need to be very specific about what you pull out of it. You can't just load up the module because your site will become like 20 megs instantaneously. Not good. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to, uh, sorry, service. We're going to import a couple of things. So we're going to import the HTTP library from Angular. We're going to create an explicit observable rather than a behavior subject eventually. And we're going to import another two operators, map and switch map, which I'll get to in a second. Okay. Now, at the end here, uh, end here, we can, that's the right one. Okay, oops, I forgot something. I need to inject HTTP because its lifecycle is also controlled by Angular. Okay, great. Ah, if I can only spell TP, <laughs> damn. What a way to make a room full of people make you think you're an idiot. Okay, awesome. So you'll see that we've got this HTTP get that looks very similar to any other get in any other language, except it's not a promise. That's an RxJS stream. It creates a stream, and as soon as you call .map, it actually triggers it off. So nothing happens until we call map. And map says, cool, I've now got a subscriber that's going to get the response and map the JSON out. Okay, so there is an initial stream. Remember I was saying that Angular has RxJS built in for everything? Well, this is that. Now, the next thing we're going to do after that is we're going to create an explicit observer. Okay, that observer is an emit. Okay. Uh, and inside that, we're going to wrap around the functionality that listens to the WebSocket. And we're going to control and explicitly add the next item onto that observer whenever the socket comes in. But now we can treat the emit like a reactive stream. So the simple and easy thing to do would be to just, well, subscribe to the get and then set, oh, I forgot something. All right. So I needed to create a list of tweets. Okay. And that's going to be a new behavior subject spelt like an American and it's just going to be an anonymous array to start. Okay. Great. Um, so we ex we're going to, when we get that list of tweets back, we're going to smash it on top. And then after that, we're going to, on emit, we're going to subscribe to emit separately. And then when a tweet comes in, we're going to unshift it onto the front, right? Okay. So we've got those two things. That's all good. Let's just start with that for the moment. Now in our app module, Oops, so you're not in our app module, in our app component. We are going to need to import the stream service again. So at the top here, we're going to import stream service. Hopefully I can spell it this time. From stream.service. Yes, thank you very much. I'll take that. Okay, format. And then in here, all we're going to do is we're just going to have a constructor that's going to inject the stream service and pass it through. We're not going to touch it. And then in our app component, component.html, we're going to throw away the stuff that we don't want because that's pointless. Then after that, we're going to, uh, app one, yep, we're going to have a little bit of generated code. So the stuff in an Angular that's got a star in front of it says that I'm going to generate items that follow this little template, okay? Um, and essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to iterate over the stream of tweets. It's going to get an instance of each tweet off of that array, and then it's going to show that tweet text. Now, this lets us write it in an imperative fashion, but the filter basically says this isn't just a simple array that you can, you can bind over. We're going to listen to an asynchronous stream, and we're going to, when we get something, operate this. Okay, all good. Great. So hopefully, yay. And we've got stuff coming through. There is someone in your shadow. <laughs> That's creepy. Okay, well, <laughs> all right. So we got, we got two people, two people. Is this thing on three people, four people? Awesome. Great. So we've at least got some stuff coming through. Now let's build on that. Okay. So something's working. I'm feeling a lot more comfortable, right? So we're going we're gonna to take every single one of those tweets and we're going to build a component and feed the data into that tweet component. 
Okay, so we're going to use our, our shortcut ngg for generate. We're going to generate a component, so with a C, and we're going to call it tweet. Not teat, tweet. <laughs> this is going to be recorded. You know that, right? <laughs> I need to watch myself very carefully. Okay, that's going to do the same thing. It's going to create an HTML file, and it's going to create a TypeScript file and update our module. Um, then when we go to our tweet component, okay, we're going to add another annotation here called input. Okay. So now on our input annotation, what that means is that this component, as a completely separate widgety thing on the page, is going to take something as an input. Now, now that item is going to be a tweet. And because I'm old school like that, I'm just going to make it an any type, which is TypeScript shortcut for saying that I don't care about typing, because life's too short for static typing. Okay. Awesome. OK. All right. Now, when we go to the front end for this, uh, we're going to throw away that stuff. That doesn't matter. I've baked a whole bunch of HTML in before that's um, far too long to type out and basically just renders it and formats the stuff nicely. And then how we're going to use this is actually the interesting part, right? So rather than having a div in our generator, we're going to have it as an app tweet, so a virtual, uh, virtual element. Okay, HTML element. This is the thing that exists in our application, and all it means is that our ng4 is going to create a new one of these components every single time it comes in. On top of that, we're also using that property binding that we saw earlier, which says that I'm going to, whenever this thing updates or gets updates, I'm going to set the, the property, which is the at input. So this app tweet, tweet, tweet goes into the input of tweet in the tweet component. Okay, <laughs> as long as we're all clear on that. I'm expecting questions afterwards, huh? Okay, so let's shut all of that down. That'll work, and if everything works, yay! Last minute panic, great. And the first thing on the screen is my last minute panic this morning. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so, so this is all cool, um, but let's build on top of this, right? Because the whole point of this stuff is that we can layer these streams relatively deep without having to write nested callback hell code, okay? So what we're gonna do to be able to, I'm way ahead of my notes now. Yeah, we're going to add a little bit of flair in our app component. So we've got this stream, and we're not going to touch the stream that's going out, but we can additionally operate on it. Okay? So we're going to use an external library called Masonry. Now our Masonry library is going to, um, again, just be declared externally, because um, it's outside of a TypeScript space. Now if I wasn't being lazy, I could create a TypeScript definition file for Masonry so that I get type checking against everything, but yeah, I, I can see the people that know me well, they're nodding actively. All right, so let's go, and additionally after that, we're going to, oopsie, uh, masonry, masonry. We're going to create a new masonry object. Now this thing is going to look at our app root HTML element, which is the, the heart and the, the first point of our Angular application. And then there's an embedded tweet CSS selector that it's going to bind off of. Now, whenever it finds an embedded tweet, we're going to operate on that. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some layout magic. All right, so if we go masonry, masonry subscribe, blah, 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 blah. What we've got is we've got our stream.tweets, which is a direct raw observable. Okay, uh, and then after that, we're just using debounce time one. So remember, we've got the, the get and the, the, um, the emit that's coming back. And we just want to make sure that all the changes finish, finish processing before we go and subscribe and lay out everything. Okay, and then hopefully when things come in, things come in, somebody help me, somebody help me. Come on, somebody help me. Don't leave me hanging. Anyway, it's going to relay out. Okay, trust me on that. We'll see it later. Cool, so now... This is all great, but we've basically set two completely separate streams. Now, this is not a very functional way of doing things, right? We want to, and it's got a race condition in it, that what happens if the emit comes back before the, the, the get all comes back, like if we've got a massive list of tweets. So basically, we're going to throw all this stuff away. Cool. That's going to break everything. We're also going to change our emit from being a static observable create to, uh, it's five, I think, be a function. And that function is going to take in our list of tweets, and everything internally is going to operate on that list of tweets. Okay? Now, additionally, how we're going to make this magic work is we're going to 
switch map between the two. And I know I have to change type there, but what switch map does is it says I'm translating from one observable to another observable, and I'm, f them, I'm piping them together so that they can operate together cohesively. Okay, cool. So for this, we're now no longer going to use behavior subjects. So we're going to throw all of this typing information away, and we're just going to create an observable of the vel observable. That's recorded forever. You know that, right? <laughs> Damn. Okay, cool. An observable of type any that's an array. Now, hopefully it still works. Yeah, it still works. Thanks, Katie. Too late, but thank you. Um, cool, so that's, that's all that. That's that code. Uh, and as an aside, for those of you that have seen the Twitter wall outside, it's not running the exact same code. There's a little bit of extra jazz in there, but um, it's, it's basically it. The code's up, up on GitHub, and this is also up on GitHub if you want to check it out later, if you're curious about this. I'm not done. Don't start applauding yet. All right, cool. So demo worked. Thank you, demo gods. So thank you very much, guys. It was lots of fun. <laughs>